Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. You are deep in the heat of battling some devil spawn creature in the bowels of a long abandoned research center on some distant planet, with only 6% charge left in your plasma rifle, and you just use your last health pack. At times like this, you probably aren't thinking about the hardware architecture of your Xbox 360, the years spent designing it, the painful trade-offs, and the decisions along the road, or the ongoing challenges of trying to decrease the manufacturing costs. You might not, but Nick Baker does. Hello. I'm Robert Hess, and I'll be your host today as we talk with Nick Baker, General Manager for Xbox Architectural Design. I hope you enjoy this chance to look at the technology and the person behind the code. After graduating from Imperial College London in 1990, he found his way to Apple and worked on the team that tried to create a specialized video card. He then went to 3DO, where he worked on their high-end gaming system, which unfortunately failed in the market. In 1997, he joined Microsoft, to work on their web TV team on their next generation set-top box known as Ultimate TV. It was during this time that Microsoft's Xbox was entering its initial design phase, and because Nick and his team had already done some research at adding gameplay capabilities to Ultimate TV, they provided some useful guidance on the first Xbox hardware design. Nick's assistance with the initial Xbox design was seen as pivotal enough that in 2002 he was asked to head up the team that would design the next generation hardware which would be eventually become known as Xbox 360. It is there that Nick Baker finds himself, to this day, working hard at fine-tuning the design of the system, its costs, and its performance. Join me now as I welcome today's guest, Nick Baker. Greetings, Nick. Morning. Glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Now, I suppose to begin with, we need to discuss the fact that probably need to change the name of this show from Behind the Code to Behind the Soldering Iron or something. <laughs> behind the Hardware. Yeah, you, you really don't do that much coding yourself, do you? Uh, no, not anymore. Yeah, but now it's more of a hardware architectural model. Yeah, we, uh, a lot of it is uh, managing our partners to deliver the, um, the, the, deliver the newer designs. Um, we do a lot of research, um, but in terms of you know, research into the architecture, but in terms of actual coding, um, I actually unfortunately gave that up about 10 years ago. Oh, well, that's a shame. That's a shame. I just, I feel sorry for you. Yeah. So how did you actually get started down this path for technology? So, um, yeah, I mean, ever since um, probably about 10, age of 10, I got uh, interested in electronics mm -hmm. and kind of locked in that that's what I what wanted to do. I didn't know which avenue that would uh, specifically take. At um, uh, some point, you know, I wanted to, interested in doing computer architecture, I ended up being more interested in graphics and the visual side of things, which probably led me to um, where I am today, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have gone to 3DO and uh, so on, and then led into the game industry. Yeah, that, so, so do you remember what your first computer was then? Yeah, it was a Sinclair ZX81, as we call them in England. Yeah, I guess yeah. ZX81, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, these days it seems like the big thing on a lot of the blog sites is when some new computer hardware device comes out, they have this gutting of the system, ripping it apart and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Did you take your, your Sinclair apart? No, I mean, it was, I was back then I was too... I mean, paid a lot of money for it. And <laughs> <laughs> I used to pull stuff apart, but it was like old TVs and uh, mm -hmm. things like that. Now, were you trying to fix them or just trying to rip them apart? <clears throat> just trying to rip them apart, <laughs> see what was inside there. <laughs> see what was inside them. I see my son doing exactly the same thing with the old uh, Xbox One controllers the other day as well. So. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's like he's heading down the same path right yeah, now. That'd be good. And uh, your, your schooling and stuff like that, that um, you were at Imperial College, mm -hmm. and that's where you graduated from. Prior to that, were you also doing some hardware stuff there? Or? 
I tinkered a little bit. Um, my father started buying me electronics magazines. Um, you know, tried building a few like simple circuits, traffic light controllers, and stuff like that. Um, when I went into high school, they didn't. They had a little bit of rudimentary electronics, but most of the stuff that I had done up until I got to college was, you know, just from you know, building circuits and stuff like that from magazines. Mm -hmm. Then in, in Imperial College, uh, what specifically did you study there? Uh, electrical engineering. Um, it was a four-year master's degree. Um, it was, um, <clears throat> I, I targeted more towards software and um, um, to microelectronics design. The uh, course had a lot of, um, you know, larger um, electrical engineering um, motors and stuff like that. That didn't interest me too much. I was, you know, from the day one, pretty set on doing microelectronics and computer architecture. And mm -hmm. yeah. now, so then um, from college then, you went uh, to Apple directly? I did, yes. Okay. And uh, uh, what was that like, going from college to a company like Apple? I worked at, um, I interned during the summers at um, uh, Thorny MI in England, so I was already kind of familiar with the corporate environment already. So from that standpoint, it wasn't too much of a mm -hmm. shock, but um, I remember getting off the plane and driving down um, Highway 101 from San Francisco Airport and you know, seeing the whole foreign environment, thinking, wow, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> So. And how old were you then? Uh, I was 25, 26. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, your... This your, was in 1990, so... 1990, yeah. So it, uh, and your, your role there at Apple to begin with was spe specifically for their video card they're working on? They, yeah, it was the video products group. And this was as QuickTime was being developed, and we were working on some video acceleration cards, you know, simple uh, compression, mm -hmm. compression schemes, put in hardware to you know, help with the capturing. Mm -hmm. And you, you were just uh, a member on the team, or were you? Yeah, I was a member. Um, we had a, on the particular car that I was working on, there was a, um, there was a silicon lead, and there were two engineers. And this was back in the days when you could do a chip just with three, <laughs> three people. Um, and then we, there, there was a, a guy that was doing the board as well. So it was relatively small. Mm -hmm. The software team, of course, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. But uh, just focusing on just the hardware itself, and uh, then that lasted for a couple of years. Then, or yeah, we uh, probably even less than that. Right, nine months into the project, um, they Apple, you know, did a pretty major reshuffle. Decided they were going to drop a lot of the adding cards business, and mm -hmm. our, our project was put on the shelf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, did, is that when you left Apple, or did you no, stay for a while? No, we did. Um, so the video products group got split up. There was more of a video architecture group. I can't remember exactly what we called ourselves, but we were looking at more focused on pulling in video onto the motherboard. Um, so as you know, new um, Apple computers came out, um, you know, and they had video capability being built into the motherboard, we, we would Specking those those chips. We didn't weren't necessarily doing the designs ourselves anymore. It was um, you know working with Philips and others to do the um, mm -hmm. to do the silicon. Now the the challenge there I would expect is you know back in those days they they could see that the video was progressing at a fairly steady pace, and if you start sticking video on the board, suddenly that now creates a board that is stuck in time mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Whereas if you add in card, you can actually take and modify things moving forward. I mean. The, the PC back in those days was having mostly plug-in cards and, mm -hmm. and the Mac was mostly as a board. And I'm sure there was a lot of, a lot of decisions and political conversations going on yeah. understanding the right way to go. For baseband video, um, back then it was NTSC PAL. I mean, HD was still yeah. far off. And yeah. from that standpoint, it was, you know, at least supporting um, uncompressed video, you know, it was as good as probably you, you needed for a while. Um, we put in architectures to um, have a parallel pixel bus so that the, the raw bandwidth didn't need to you know, go through main memory, for example. And then um, part of the idea was to have you know, a slot that you could add in a compression card, for example, that somebody else, somebody else could do. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, if you look back at the last 10 years, yeah, then the, the experience you know, been quite an explosive rate of uh, mm -hmm. um, growth there on the capabilities. 
And then from, from Apple, you went from there to 3DO? That's correct. So I was three years, three years at Apple. Um, we had a fair number of people leave, um, particularly from some of my friends that worked, worked with at Apple and over to 3DO. And uh, from a getting into the graphics side of things, um, getting back to what I was, what I wanted to do back at college. While I was at Apple, I'd actually taken a um, 3D graphics class at Stanford. Um, and so with the opportunity of going and working at uh, 3DO, that was taking me more close to what I wanted to do there. Mm -hmm. um, I'd started working on video, of course, at um, 3DO, because that's what I'd been doing at Apple. So I did a little video NTSC PAL encoder design. And then uh, after that, um, shipped successfully in the cost reduction. Um, went and uh, started working on the next um, rendering engine. And so, but you know, you're talking about focusing on, on 3D architecture. I'm, I'm assuming that's got to be different from the, the hardware architecture standpoint that I think about from a software architecture standpoint. I mean, I think about, you know, de designing the, the, the pixels and designing the objects that I'm going to take and programmatically move around, where you're mm -hmm. actually thinking about how does the card itself understand and assist in this process? Because you're not, you're no longer just simply being. I'm going to turn these pixels to allow the programmer to address mm -hmm. things. We need to be a part yeah, of. Yeah, it. it's a. Um, I mean, you, you got to define the API, the level between you know, the handoff between the software and the hardware. Um, and once you once you have that, you know, there's at least back then there were fixed functions that you wanted to do in hardware. Mm -hmm. um, so you want to do setup, you want to do shading, you want to do texturing, um, and a lot of the a lot of those algorithms, you know, are um, pretty well pretty well defined and developed. Even when I when I started, so the trick was to really do it as cheaply as possible in the hardware, um, because back then doing rendering still was relatively taxing from a um, hardware hardware perspective. Mm -hmm. um, the first design that I started off was probably one of the first. PC kind of adding card complexity um, chips that had a hardware setup engine, for example. Um, so that was, you know, you started with just, you know, rendering pixels and then texturing and then um, moving higher up the uh, pipeline doing setup. Um, and so the, the, you know, a lot of it was trying to um, figure out how to do the the cheapest thing in hardware, where you can cheat with the algorithms, and you know you can't necessarily detect that there's anything anything different. How much precision to use in different stages of the pipeline to get an acceptable result, um, and then uh, big challenge is pipelining, which you probably don't necessarily think too much about at the software level. I know you, you want to do loop unrolling and optimizations and stuff like that. But if you uh, want to meet, say, a, a throughput of a particular rate, you actually have to design your whole pipeline um, to be able to handle that. And if you have any memory accesses, you need to um, figure out how to absorb that memory latency. So there's a lot of the um, design, uh, design choices there. Yeah, I mean, because the hardware itself, I mean, like programmers quite often just think of, oh, it's just the video card, I'm going to just throw some pixels at it. But there's actually a lot more work that goes on from mm -hmm. that standpoint yep. to be considered. So what were some of the big challenges you had at 3DO then? The, uh, um, probably because we hadn't done, um, it was the first setup um, engine, so we had to, you know, work, uh, work on that. Um, texturing back then was still quite a bit, um, of a, uh, the, the bandwidth required was challenging from meeting that on the, um, on the architecture. So we tried to tackle it from a different way, like using an SRAM um, cache, for example, rather than going to main memory and flooding the, uh, flooding the memory. So that was probably the most interesting uh, parts of that, designing a fully uh, floating point setup engine and uh, getting the texturing, getting mm -hmm. the texturing right. Mm -hmm. Now, what were some of the other gaming systems back in those days, just so we kind of remember what the, the, the landscape was like? Um, so back then, we were, um, and I remember that 3DO, we were actually trying to go after the first Sony PlayStation. So mm -hmm. the, the 3DO system um, launched in 96 or 7, I can't remember um, off the top of my head anymore. Um, and suddenly when we were working on the next-gen design, um, the one of the 
people you were tra talking to was Sony. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that, the, this, the, this was when a lot of those systems were. I mean, so we're, we're basically talking first generation of all the yeah. machines that are out there today. Yeah. Well, obviously it's Sega and uh, Atari yeah. and Nintendo and Wine yeah, but, uh, before us. But. So, the, so games back in those days were nowhere near as sophisticated as they are today. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't mean the problems are that much harder to face. Yeah, I mean, the, the next generation 3DO that we uh, worked on was, would have been the first 3D um, true 3D renderer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything else until then had been sprites, including the first uh, um, the first 3DO system. But of course, just like you know, today business back then is kind of a cutthroat business, and so everyone's kind of battling for position. And 3DO didn't quite make it across the bar. Yeah, it was a little. There's you now obviously several several reasons. Probably one of them was the it was a little bit defocused in terms of. Um, what the product was trying to be. Um, we're trying to sell it as a multiplayer. You know, what exactly does that, uh, what does that mean? Um, and the business model that was set up so that the, the price of the hardware was you know, quite, quite expensive when it came out onto the market. Mm -hmm. um, and so it didn't get a very strong launch from that, from that perspective. I think we sold like 700,000 or something like that at the, at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and then while we had been working on the next generation, um, you know, it, you know, we tried to find an avenue for that architecture out into the market. Um, it was actually sold to Panasonic. We licensed it to Panasonic and they put it in some Pashinko machines, but 3DO never um, shipped a product based on it. Mm -hmm. And then so after 3DO, you went to Microsoft then, is that right? After 3DO, that was a brief period of time uh, after 3DO decided they were going to get out of the hardware business and continue as a software entity. Uh, they spun off the, um, the hardware group. Um, there was a little company called Cajun Technologies. Um, it lasted about nine months. We were doing trying to do design, uh, licensing, um, try to license to Nintendo, um, some of our derivative architecture from the uh, from the 360. Uh, I mean, sorry, from the from 3DO next generation. Um, so basically, just taking, trying to take some of your IP and getting something out of that. Yeah. So we, you know, uh, so the, we, the that was the original 3DO, um, but then the next generation was M2, and that was the one that was sold to Panasonic. We started working on a project that we called MX, which um, you know we basically had the design up and running for that, um, and we were showing that to mm -hmm. showing that to Nintendo at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And, so then, and then, and then, so that that company lasted about nine months. We were owned by Samsung um, when the um, Asian crisis hit back at the end of the '90s. The uh, you know, Samsung wanted to remove some inve or get out some investments, and Web TV picked us up just after they were purchased by Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Web TV, which which isn't around anymore, can you kind of remind us what that was exactly? Well, it continues as MSN TV. Um, it's it's a um, web browser for your TV, so it was designed around having a um, browser experience that worked in the, li in the living room, so the 10-foot browser experience, and also having everything be controlled by a you know, simple remote control. That was a keyboard, mm -hmm. um, but you could browse using remote control and sit back, um, and the, um, the web pages would be formatted to fit on your, fit on your TV. Mm -hmm. um, had a modem connection, this was you know, before broadband and um, Ethernet, so you know, it, it was optimized for low bandwidth browsing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a, like I said, a plug and play situation where you basically plug the things in and you were on the internet and yep. uh, doing email and browsing the web. Yep. 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 And then um, after working on that for a while in the Web TV project, you were working on Ultimate TV? Yeah, so when we, so Web TV was already um, you know, done when, when we came. Um, and so we were, and even the first uh, version of the Ultimate TV was um, well under well, well under development. So we were working on the high definition version of Ultimate TV, um, which we got to the point of having um, the demo systems available. So we actually taped out a chip, we got it back, we showed uh, high definition video decode, 
um, running. It was actually designed for dual stream high def decode, so you could do picture in picture. Um, we had that running at the end of um, 99, beginning of 99, I can't, I can't remember exactly when. Um, and so that, that, that's, we came in and started working on that design um, around about that time. Um, the, um, web, um, Ultima TV you know, decided that the um, high-end set-top boxes were beginning, beginning hard to monetize, and so we never shipped the, uh, shipped the high-definition version. Because mm -hmm. they would have been a fairly expensive purchase people would have had for their systems, just to provide that set-top box capabilities. Yeah, and it, this was back in the days when um, convergence, you know, the, 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 there was a lot of convergence or, you know, seen, the, a need seen for convergence mm -hmm. in um, set-top boxes. And so we were looking at putting in gaming and um, other stuff into the, uh, into the system. And then it was at this time also that the, the, the original Xbox design started picking up and they were interfacing with your team in some fashion? Yeah, it was um, the, the tail end of the um, next generation Ultimate TV sort of coincided with the first uh, brainstorming sessions we had on the, on the Xbox One. So that would have been around the end of uh, 1999. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you, you assisted them in some of the game stuff you were doing on the Ultimate TV and the Web TV and helping them see how some of the stuff you've already worked on already yeah. could be applicable to them. It, more, to be more accurate, it was the, more of the, in terms of the business model, because we had mm. been doing custom, custom silicon, um, to really get the cheapest possible, cheapest possible system, you know, you want to get something that you, only has the stuff that you need in it, um, and you want to be able to take it through to manufacturing yourselves, and you cut out as much margin as possible from everything in between. So um, we were bringing to the table, here's the consumer electronics method of doing, um, doing a game system. Mm -hmm. um, and that, so not, not so much that we, I mean, we had obviously an interesting technology, but it was targeted at as a, um, a set-top box um, kind of performance. It was integrated with a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, satellite tuners and everything else. So the amount of um, dedicated, if, if you were to build a dedicated game console, um, you wouldn't have all of that and you would have refactored your system slightly differently to have higher graphics capability. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really have anything that was just off the shelf ready to go and put it in the game console. Right. But, but you did have the thought process you went through and saw where Ultimate TV was actually having trouble in realizing, hey, if we had to go back from scratch and do this again, maybe we would have taken a different approach. Yeah, I think more from the silicon business yeah. side of things. So, I mean, we, we knew how to do consumer electronics and mm -hmm. you know, the, the pitch was his, his, his a way of doing the, doing the 360 and mm -hmm. um, replicate that model. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I'm sorry, the Xbox, the, the Xbox, one, the Xbox one. Yeah. And so then the, the original Xbox comes out, uh, you were basically just kind of an assistant in consult from a consulting standpoint, some of that stuff. And then... Yeah, it was a little bit more, more involved um, than that. I mean, we had a... In some of the early um, strategy brainstorming sessions, you know, you had... Um, you know, several opposing um, opinions as to what the box should be. Um, I'm should sure it, more should than it be several. consumer electronics? <laughs> should we try to emulate the PC industry in the game console yep. space? Yep. Um, and so we participated in that. And then mm -hmm. we also worked, actually did start design on a potential um, architecture for the, for the Xbox One. Um, we had uh, partnered with a couple of companies and gotten um, into actually doing some design with them. We had paid some money. Um, and so we were actually on the marching along designing the Xbox One, so we thought. Um, but uh, the, uh, that got cancelled in favor of doing you know, what eventually shipped, which is a uh, Intel and NVIDIA architecture. Mm -hmm. And then how soon after the Xbox One shipped did the design process start for the next generation Xbox? 
Well, we started um, the, we got the go ahead to start looking at the um, 360 architecture in the beginning of 2002. Mm -hmm. And uh, the original Xbox shipped when? I can't remember exactly what the date was for that. It was 2001. So essentially within a year or less, yeah. the Xbox 360 yeah. project uh, got its kickoff. And is that, is that when they approached you directly to, to lead up that team? It, well, the, we needed, because we have been involved with the, um, with the Xbox One, we were already known to the team. Mm -hmm. And we, the Silicon um, group from Ultimate TV was looking for a home. And the whole group actually got transferred over to um, Xbox at the time. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just you know, one or two people. Um, we did help, the rest of the team was helping with cost reductions on the Xbox One. So we had the Tuscany cost reduction um, came out in like 2003, I believe. Uh, for that, um, there were a couple of chips that were designed by Microsoft. We had taken some of the um, smaller components on the motherboard. It was gonna be challenging to touch the CPU and the GPU, but. Um, like the video encoders and Flash and you know, the little SMC microcontroller that runs the uh, system uh, uh, monitoring um, and opens the um, DVD tray and such and stuff like that. Um, so we swept all of those into a couple of chips. Um, so part of the team was doing that, but uh, myself and uh, a few others were basically given the direction to start looking at what a, the next generation could look like. Mm -hmm. And what, what were some of the, the key things you were trying to focus on for the next generation Xbox? Like the, the, the marching orders thing you want to make sure you improved or did differently for it? Uh, it was be one, number one. <laughs> so, <laughs> a whatever. Good thing to plan for. Yeah. So back then, it, we believed that that was performance. Mm -hmm. So uh, we tried to be as smart as possible about getting a high-performing box. Mm -hmm. you know, really push the envelope on what you could do with with graphics, with the visuals. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you essentially were you were designing a PC, but a very special feature PC that only had a specific right. set of features it was doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, and we made a lot of trade-offs uh, with that as well. So anything that wasn't really central to the gaming application, we, uh, you know, we, we pulled out. So we were only you know, really getting the stuff that we thought we needed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, at the heart of any PC is the computer chip. Mm -hmm. um, and I know from some of the internal discussions I was seeing that there, at the time, there was a big hoopla raised about the fact of switching from an Intel chip to a PowerPC chip. Um, from your standpoint, what was going on in those days and the choices of going to a PowerPC rather than an Intel chip? Yeah, it was really just a matter of the, um, the right technology, uh, the right price at the right time. Um, you know, we had, you know, we had spoken, we, we, you got to understand back then that was, you know, people were predicting still, if I look at some of the slides that I had, you know, you were looking at six gigahertz, seven gigahertz, even 10 gigahertz CPUs. Um, and unfortunately, once we hit 90 nanometer technology, it became um, really evident that the power consumption for really pushing that frequency was, um, uh, was, was getting out of hand. Um, and you know, actually, one the one one of the companies that was trying to sell us really you know high end core, they actually ended up canceling canceling that project. Um, we because it couldn't meet their goals. They yeah, thought, or, and it yeah. was it was it was too far on, along that yeah. along that line of pushing yeah. the pushing the frequency. Um, so we wanted to tackle it differently. The you know multi processing you know, kind of um, it wasn't very well predicted back then. So we were probably groundbreaking in sort of seeing um, that that was the future. So we tried to go out and find smaller, cheaper cores and put down several of them. We had spoken to um, game developers that believed their code was parallelizable to some extent. I mean clearly. We couldn't throw, you know, eight cores at them. But if, you know, three or four, they said, yeah, you know, we can see how um, that partitions up. And so we, that, that, from fairly early on, that was the architecture we wanted to go ahead and, uh, 
hadn't tried to build, and it was just a matter of finding the companies that had the cores that met our, met our needs. Mm -hmm. And we weren't necessarily um, religious about whether it was PowerPC. I mean, the, the IBM just happened to have um, the, right, uh, the right cores. We looked at similar cores in the uh, uh, x86 camp, and uh, they weren't quite as far, quite as far along. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you were essentially designing a multi-car architecture before it really existed? Yeah, before the rest of the industry really went there, we, we were already working on the, uh, working, working down that path. So, so it must make you feel good then to realize that today, all of a sudden, you know, all of our laptops are, are multi-car yeah, architecture. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the new buzzword going yep. through and paralyzed computing. And, yeah, it uh, was, uh, you know, either we had very good insight or we got lucky. I'm not <laughs> sure which. Or do you think you actually kind of helped move the, the technology in that direction? No, I th when we spoke to, uh, maybe a little bit, but I think when, when we spoke to uh, companies, they were already working on these and you know, beginning to talk uh, as multi-core being sort of the way out um, you know, from uh, um, the power consumption and uh, putting more parallel uh, more and more processing units I on the die. So it, I, I wouldn't say we, we were out there showing the way to the industry. I mean, that mm -hmm. was, but mm -hmm. clearly we could have taken a bet uh, a different way and done, and done something else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, by introducing multi-core architecture and introducing the notion of parallel computing into the game designers, um, did that change their approach much at all, or do they have to rethink the way they design these games? It's no longer just simply a port from Nintendo to Sony to Xbox. You now have to think about, okay, when I go into Xbox, if I really want to take advantage, I need to think about how I go to a parallelized architecture design. Yeah, the, um, yeah that, that's the conversation we had with them early on. I mean, we knew that was going to be an issue, uh, an issue for them. Um, the feedback we got was, if you do it, don't go too wild. Um, if you look at um, you know the PlayStation 2 architecture, you know they probably went too far down that path. Um, they have nine different cores to program, and not all the same um, ISA or architecture either. Um, so you know, based on our feedback from developers, it was you know let's let's keep it as um, you know few as few as possible. Mm -hmm. But now at the same time also there was a notion of some level of compatibility with the previous model of Xbox as well. Mm -hmm. um, how did that factor in some of your design decisions? Um, well, that's an interesting uh, conversation in and of itself. Um, the, I mean, we, we wanted to not pay anything for that compatibility. We wanted it to be um, absolutely free in the hardware. You know, maybe we would pay 25 cents for it or something like that. But that was really the... Um, you know, marching orders, and um, so you know, it was really what can be done in in software emulation. Um, the and and to do that, you need a fair amount of raw processing, and so we knew we needed to, you know, clearly be more powerful than the uh, than the Xbox One by a certain uh, certain percentage to make to make uh, software emulation possible. So, so you essentially are taking the X, the original Xbox turning its, its hardware architecture into a software architecture and running it on the Xbox 360? Yeah, I mean, the co it, we're, we're taking the binary from the, uh, from the disk and it's being, the, the x86 code is being emulated um, on, using PowerPC. Yeah, because it is a different hardware architecture yep. from that standpoint. Yep. Um, and, you know, I've, I've got a bunch of old... And, and, and endian as well. I mean, x86 oh, yeah, yeah. is little yeah. endian, PowerPC is big yeah. endian. I'm going to switch that around. Because, you know, I've got a bunch of old original Xbox games that I can play perfectly fine on my Xbox 360, and then mm -hmm. they work quite well. Yeah. Um, so as you're actually designing the Xbox 360, um, aside from things like the PowerPC and getting the chip architecture down in a price standpoint, um, what are some of the big challenges you think you were facing at those days, in the, in the very early days of design? Very early, uh, 360. So uh, memory bandwidth is, has always been, you know, is always, and continues to be a challenge. Uh, if you look at the processing capabilities on the chip, well, what you can do actually in silicon, once you have everything um, on chip, um, you know, that is just going up at a much faster rate than the speed at which you can get data in and out of the, um, in and out of the chip itself. Mm -hmm. um, certainly you can 
pay a lot of money and have a lot of IOs and pay for the bandwidth and have exotic uh, memory uh, memory technologies and really push the envelope there. Um, but to you know architect the thing so it could be cost reduced over time, um, the you know that was the solving the memory bandwidth issue was probably the uh, um, top of the list and. You know, what we realized is we couldn't, I mean, if we were to put down a 256-bit bus or 512-bit bus, um, you're looking at, you know, forever constraining the size of the chip uh, based, on that, uh, based on that interface. And um, you're, you're also not able to take advantage of um, higher density memories. You know, we launched with 512 megabit, we're now shipping with one gigabit. Um, mm -hmm memory density. Um, so, you know, we, we wanted to not go that way, um, but we do need a lot of bandwidth. And so the option that we picked was to use embedded DRAM. Um, well, that's really the first, um, you know, game architecture to, to do that either, but it was sort of the natural choice for setting up the business the right way um, to uh, have uh, long-term cost reduction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when you mention long-term cost reduction, um, you're, you're getting to the standpoint when, when the Xbox 360 came out, Microsoft was basically losing money on the hardware. We were mm -hmm. selling hardware for less than it cost us to make and uh, making it up by... Subsidized. Sub, 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 <laughs> subsidized hardware um, and using the, the licensing fees coming in from the games to take and help make the mm -hmm. business actually profitable. Now, Clearly, you were also needing to take and identify how, moving forward, the, the exact same machine could be made cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, mm -hmm. and you were actually designing that in from, from the beginning. Yeah, and so all, a lot of the design um, trade-offs and choices we made were, were particularly with that in mind. Um, another um, key factor, not just from the design itself, is getting control over the design. So, you know, if we're going to be shipping something for, you know, five, six, eight, Ten years. Um, you know, if you look at the you know the design team um, that was there when you when you launched, um, you know, you look at the the company that was there um, when you launched, um, and the products that they're working on, you quickly start diverging. So yeah, maybe you can have a discussion that says we're going to um, you know work on a next version of the chip that's cheaper um, a year from now, two years from now, but go back to the same company six years from now, you know, eight years, and, you know, you quickly see that, you know, the um, interests diverge mm -hmm. um, pretty quickly. So, you, know, you want to set the um, business up to be able to uh, um, cost reduce as well as the technology itself. So, you know, we structured the um, engagements with our partners so that, you know, we, no matter how long we wanted to ship this thing, we could still keep on working on cost reductions, get the design. We do, and that, so we did a lot of work um, in, inside in terms of simulation, pulling the design in, making sure that if, you know, at the end of the day, you know, IBM or ATI, which is now AMD, uh, case in point, um, you know, went away, we would have the design, we would know what to do with it, and uh, we could uh, continue doing the, doing the cost reductions. Yeah, you know, you don't want to be stuck out on a limb. You want to take exactly. and make sure you're in as full control we as possible. control our destiny. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so, like, you know, we're, we're moving forward to taking and making sure that the, today's Xbox 360 is cheaper for us to manufacture than the original Xbox 360. Mm -hmm. um, besides just simply making the hardware cheaper, what else are we doing? I mean, are we are we improving the box at all, or making any modifications to it? It's hard to um, improve the box from a because feature. it's so good already, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> obviously. Uh, but no, from a feature perspective, I mean, it's hard to come out with new features on a game console because the um, uh, the whole model, the you know, the ecosystem relies on having a fixed platform and mm -hmm. having it that. And you're pretty much guaranteeing that the last game that you ever ship um, will run on the first console ever produced, and vice versa. So the first game will run on the you know last console. And as the time gets further, you know, that gets uh, um, could, could get more challenging unless you guarantee that. You have binary compatibility all the way along, and if you know you come out with a 
a new widget or something like that in the in the box, um, then you know you've all, the the launch games won't know about that, and so you know. It, it's not always, I and mean, you, you can look at history here in the game industry, and you know, you know, custom add-ons late in a generation don't necessarily uh, um, make uh, make much sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, where where do you make changes? Is it is it just simply in identifying how to make the parts cheaper? It's uh, it. Yeah, I mean, everything everything cost reduces. Silicon probably cost reduces uh, more than anything else. And I have like, a couple examples to show you exactly um, why that's the case. So this is a wafer. Um, this is of the launch um, 360, the GPU. So on the actual um, GPU die, there are, um, package, there are two die. This is the, um, what we call the parent die. Um, which has all of the shaders and the texturing mm -hmm. and stuff like that. There's a... So I didn't realize the, the chip inside the Xbox was that big. <laughs> yeah, we cram it down yeah. really well. No, so this actually has, uh, when we launched, uh, so this is a 19 nanometer wafer. Um, it has about 326 um, chips on here. Mm -hmm. so, so, so each, each square here then yeah. is, a, is an individual chip that would be right. cut out and placed on silicon and right. stuck in the machine. So you would, you would, you would cut this up. Um, and uh, package it, and then actually on the 360, you would end up. Um, this is this chip right here. Let's see here. Yeah. So this is the this is the GPU um, right there. This is the little um, ED RAM ED RAM chip, and this is the CPU down here. Mm -hmm. um, so you you cut this up and you package it and you put it uh, um, put it in the system. Um, so then, how this gets cheaper? is then, um, you know, side by side here, now we have a, um, this is a 65 nanometer um, silicon parent die, same one that we're now, uh, which is shipping in 360s today, if you go and, if you mm -hmm. go and buy one. Um, so the benefit, you know, obviously you can see that, you know, the wafer more or less costs the same. This one's got about 550 odd um, die on the on the wafer, and so you know you're able to for the same amount of money for the wafer you're able to produce more um, more 360s. Um, the other other benefit is of course that the power consumption um, decreases, and so over time you're able to you know make the box um, consume less power, which is uh, mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. eco friendly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just basically, you know, cost reduction, size reduction, energy reduction throughout the entire process right. makes the box, you know, that much better of a box to, to work with. Yeah. Now, you know, we talked about the, the original Xbox, and Xbox 360, there was um, a short period of time after the original Xbox ship that the Xbox 360 started to work on. Now we've shipped Xbox 360, how long ago was that? This, that was in uh, November 2005. So here we are, 2009. Would the assumption be there's already work underway for the next Xbox? Yeah, we're always working on research projects. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's through those research projects we actually are differentiating our line right. from the other lines right. because there there is a big competition going yeah. on out there. There's yeah, and we're we're constantly working on stuff, and I think if you look at, I mean, our next big bet is Project Natal, mm -hmm. um, clearly. So, and how, how do you see that changing things? The really this new way of interacting with the um, with the console and potentially with um, technology, uh, consumer electronics itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you know, we, we've got to realize that you know some of that concept was kind of introduced by the Wii, mm -hmm. um, and when it came out, I remember when the when the before Xbox and Sony and Wii were all kind of in the design phase, and we'd see the news that and stuff like that. Um, it seemed like. The PlayStation and the Xbox were the ones that were, you know, pounding their chest and saying how great they are. And they look at the Wii and say, you know, it's a cheaper machine. It's got worse graphics and sort stuff. Oh, I just don't even pay attention yeah, to so it. So, like I said, we wanted to win on performance, and we won on performance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and but then, then the Wii showed us, hey, there's there's something else to pay attention to too, and that's uh, how you interact with how the how the game, how the device participates in your world, mm -hmm. which um, I think does change the way we think about yeah. games in the future. Yeah, and if you look at the games that we, at least I, I play at home with the kids, I mean, it's Rock Band. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's uh, certainly from the graphical fidelity, it's not, um, 
you know, you don't need it suddenly for that. Right, right, you know. right. It's, it's, it's the interaction, the, yeah. the the participation level you have. It's no longer just you know playing around with the gamepad. Yeah, going it's back actually and, going back and trying to learn drumming on the next level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with the other platforms out there, I mean, how much of a you know competitive architecture are we taking and planning on, and and looking at what the other companies are doing, and understanding how to take and advance the whole market forward. On the on, you know hardware design and stuff like that. I mean, because you know you've you've obviously got to be constantly thinking about you know what's coming next. How do I prepare for that? Um, what's the, you know, without actually giving away anything? How are you preparing yourself for it? Yeah, so we continually keep in contact with um, the hardware community. You know, understanding their capabilities. We're you know, continually talking to developers, understanding where where they're going. Um, we're continually talking to you know, micro, internal teams within Microsoft, Microsoft Research, um, understanding where they're going, um, and you know, formulating you know, what can be done um, in the future. And some of the things we say, hey, we got something. Let's go. Let's go and do this. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, obviously, we have several of those going on at uh, going on at once. But that, that's kind of the process. You know, con continually. Seeing what's out there, you know, starting up incubations, mm -hmm. looking at uh, what interesting products could be. Mm -hmm. Now, with um, with the Xbox 360, one of the one of the features it contained was being a media center extender. Mm -hmm. So, if you've got a media center PC in the same household across a wireless net, internet or something like that, the uh, the Xbox 360 can now, since it's connected to the TV set, mm -hmm. um, it can actually extend that experience. Um, yeah, I mean, we play we play DVDs as well. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure. You know, these aren't very well advertised features of the 360, but you know, certainly uh, you can play movies. You can. Uh, um, you know, we now have Netflix, which actually I use, um, and Media Center mm -hmm. um, extender as well. But isn't this almost turning the Xbox 360 into Ultimate TV? Uh, well, we don't have tuners, <laughs> so <laughs> not not exactly. But I mean, we there was. And you know, people don't know about these other features, you know, part, partly for a reason. I mean, we are a game console, and we don't want to muddy that message. Mm -hmm. We do have other entertainment features—a very capable box. Um, you can do video streaming, video. Mm -hmm. We do have Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a you know very um, uh, decent size video library, arcade downloadable arcade library. Um, so for you know downloading. Content you don't have to go out and buy everything in a in a store. You can get it uh, get it through a wire into your home. Um, so a lot of uh, other multimedia capabilities, but we are a game system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and a very good one too. Yeah, <laughs>Well, what, what I'd, I really enjoyed talking with you. What I'd like to do now is take and switch over to uh, what we call our, our mantra questions, mm -hmm. uh, a set of questions that we're going to ask all of our guests and just kind of get a feeling for how everyone kind of feels about technology and, and what they're doing. Yeah, grab those out here. So, you know, we did actually give you a preview of these questions, so hopefully these aren't quite uh, yeah. off the cuff for you. But um, what book would you like to recommend everyone to read? So other than The Hobbit? <laughs> no, but that's, that's a perfectly good book. No, I absolutely love uh, Tolkien, so uh, Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Um, mm -hmm. I think more from a um, you know, technology um, standpoint, though, obviously I have, some, I have my favorites on you know, deep technical aspects. So you know, uh, I think one of the most interesting ones I read uh, was the uh, real-time rendering of Miller and Haynes. Um, that gives you a lot of insight as to... Not quite as exciting as Tolkien. <laughs> no, <it>? I know. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, kind of a wacky one, um, Vonnegut's Play a Piano. I thought that was, you know, interesting. So I, I read it, I believe, when uh, there was the GM Foods scare. And um, it was very interesting to see that, well, you know, you know, march against technology and then the subtle twist at the end where all of a sudden it's like, well, here's a, this old player piano sitting in the corner of this bar that started tinkering then, starting to get it going just after the hordes had been going around smashing everything. So um, interesting, I mean, you know, written obviously when, you know, computers weren't envisaged. I mean, a lot of... Much less the internet. 
much, <laughs> much less the internet, but still, you know, the role of technology in our society and the, you know, mm -hmm. tendency sometimes to get carried away and hating it. And then also, you know, we take, you know, we rely on it in so many other ways as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's more just making sure that we know who's in control. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, um, if you weren't working in the computer industry, what do you think you'd be doing? So I wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I, I don't uh, think after um, I, I, I got out of that pretty uh, um, pretty quickly. And how old were you when you wanted to be an astronaut? Actually, probably up till about sixteen, seventeen, yeah. or something like that. Um, if I um, you know had my choice now, I think it'd probably be like a ski instructor or a, a dive instructor or a uh, you know. Yeah, you know, wine grower or something like oh, there that. There you go. Yeah. We, we got all those around here. We got, we got, we got skiing, we got diving, we got wine growing here. Well, you got that in California as well. That's so. right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So you're from California. So, uh, um, what do you feel is the most important important technology in today's world? So I'm going to have to say like uh, solar power. Oh, really? I believe, yeah. Really. Do you think we're making good progress with solar power? I think we could be, obviously, with uh, the right investments, could be making more. Um, you know, hear a lot about, you know, well, so I, I would say alternative energy, solar and wind mm -hmm. um, in particular. Um, but I, I, I read about, you know, us you know, trying to make, uh, build new solar farms or wind farms and then not having the infrastructure and the grid capa capability to hook that up to where you actually need it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, actually being able to wire these things up, the, there is a more investment that is needed. But you know, we've, you know, tried to put solar on our house and got a no bid because we don't have a south facing roof. So, oh. <laughs> but I thought the solar <laughs> companies say that any house can be made solar, though, can't they? Or? Yeah, well, you need a south facing roof, otherwise yeah. they won't come and install it. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. okay, it's good. Um, At least for us. Twenty-five years from now, what technology would you like to see available? So if I really knew, I probably wouldn't be here, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure it's going to be something that when I'm there, I'll know what it is, and it's got, going to be something around that uh, maintaining my vision and hearing and keeping me, uh, keeping me going, I'm sure, and recovering from skiing injuries. <laughs> <laughs> so you're seeing more of uh, almost a, a medical or biomedical probably, uh, type that, of... I mean, that would probably be where my main concern is in 25 years' time, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, even some of the, the computer technology stuff that we talk about now is, is moving into the biomechanical sort of realm. Yeah. And so you're actually growing chips yeah. rather than... Yeah, suddenly with chips. a little micro-robots help in surgery and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, for the, for the last one, this is going to require some of your creative talents, <laughs> I think, here. Uh, we'd like you to draw and then explain your favorite data structure. Okay. But now, since, since you're not a programmer... Um, yeah, I, I didn't think a linked list would be very, uh, <laughs> very so do, exciting. Do you, have, do you have something in mind, do you think? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I was always um, fascinated by, you know, arrays and arrays of hardware. Um, and I, I know it's um, rather simple, but, um, you know, from... Um, you know, doing multiplication in hardware. So if you're writing a program, you, you, you pretty much do, uh, um, you know, x equals um, a times b, and out, out pops the answer. Um, if you were to, uh, it's actually a um, good in, uh, interview question as well, because um, if you... Um, ask somebody, well, so you know how to multiply, you know, if you were to, say, multiply two numbers together, they would pretty much um, be able to do that. And now, say, design this in hardware, how would you go about doing it? And making the leap from, you know, say, say you have 10 by 10 and multiplying that out, take, doing that in a binary, um, you know, becomes... Uh, um, no, don't, don't always make that uh, make that leap, and so. But it is pretty much the uh, pretty much the same. It becomes very simple in uh, in hardware. So if you think about if I have um, you know two uh, four bit numbers, and I want to you know multiply these um, together, well, it really just becomes you know let's take this guy and. Um, you know, multiply by this, which in binary is just an and. So you would do um, 0, 1, 0, 1. And then for the next guy, um, it's, you know, equivalent to multiply by 10 is shift left by 1. So you would now, you know, this put, put all zeros and, and so on. Okay. 
and then now becomes an addition, a series of shifts in addition. Um, so if you were to uh, design this in hardware, um, all you really need is a couple of elements. You need um, an AND gate um, to, you know, AND um, either by um, zero or one, and then you need a full, full adder, which is basically, you know, takes in one bit A plus B, carry in, get a carry out, um, and, a, and a sum. And then it's just realizing this, um, this um, arithmetic in, in an array structure. And um, what you end up uh, wanting to uh, design, um, you would start off by doing, um, so have your AND terms, A0, B0, So these are now your B0, this is B, um, B, this is A. So this guy here is B0, B1, B2, B3, A0, A1, A2, A3. Um, you can see from here that this guy just falls straight out. So that's your first, uh, first product term. Um, from this, you want to now look at adding this guy um, together, so employ um, one of these. And you would feed in now your um, A0, B1 term. So this is now you see everything's beginning to get uh, shifted over. You got to hook up the carry in. Um, this is just going to be zero at this point. And you can see you can march along here, and do the same thing A1, B1. A2, B1, and then A3, B1. So you wire these guys up. Now you go move down to the next um, to the next row. Here's your uh, next product term coming out here. Probably haven't left myself enough space here. And probably for the interest of time, I'll uh, you know, just draw out what it'll conceptually look like. Rushing a little bit too uh, too much here. Uh. Well, I mean, so essentially, what we've got here is we're taking something that started off as more of a a mental problem, turning that into an understanding of from a pure software standpoint, mm -hmm. then taking and seeing how the software can be emulated in hardware, and then reapplying the software into the hardware yep. to end up with the equation coming out. Yep. Page, but uh, you you end up uh, with uh, you know uh, what I was always fascinated by just creating hardware with uh, with arrays, mm -hmm. um, and you know the the question you um, had about uh, security and stuff. Well, the result can be shown to be an eight bit number if you have four bits, so there's no overflow or no buffer over mm -hmm. or anything uh, mm -hmm. anything like that. Well, make sure you, make sure you sign it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's incomplete. I need to uh, probably do pretty it up a little bit. That's part of the artwork, you know? Yeah. Well, thanks, Nick, from the Techno Community Network for being Thank our you. guest today. Um, and we hope you all enjoyed this chance to look at the technology and the person behind the code. <laughs>